Drones have become an important tool of war, which has revolutionized the warfare, aiding both in the surveillance of the enemy as well as allowing the direct engagement of the enemy. Without the possibility of suffering casualties, UAVs have, thanks to these factors, become a mainstay in the armies of many of the top military forces around the world, with only few exceptions. This has created a massive market for drones, which has largely been dominated by the US, Israel and China, who all entered relatively early into the industry. But over the last years, especially during the Ukraine war, we have seen the rise of two new powerhouses in this market, which have come to dominate their battlefields with their UAVs in two different ways. Today we will be covering Iran and its UAV program, as promised. Welcome back to GNR, hosted by Markus Weissmann. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss peak content anymore. Foo! The Iranian drone program, similar to basically anything in the modern Iranian army that is indigenously produced, finds its origins in American-provided military equipment given to the Iranian government as part of a larger effort to prop up the Shah's Iran as a bulwark against communism. This saw America provide Iran with all sorts of top-notch weapons, most famously the F-14, the F-5 and the M-60 tank, which Iran would try to reverse engineer and create their own indigenous versions of. But they also also received US targeting drones, which would prove to be vital in 1979, Ayatollah Khomeini took control of the Iranian government, declaring Iran to now be a revolutionary state. This of course led to widespread sanctions against Iran, which would as we'll see become a limiting factor for Iran, which was now forced to be more self-reliant and switch to indigenously produced weapons or rely on the stockpiles remaining from the Shah's army. As Michael Rubin puts it, when the Shah fell, Iran may still have been a third world country, but it possessed a first world military. But one year later, when Ba'athist Iraq, led by Saddam Hussein, invaded and became open about his intentions to secure the vital oil fields in the Kuwistan province, which is majority Arab, and seeing the current internal conflict in Iran, he saw a chance for a quicker land grab. While Iraq managed to advance into the province, at first, they were quickly fought to a still stand and forced back. While the Iranian army at this point was on paper one of the best in the world, it faced one major problem, which was that many of the skilled human resources, which were vital and necessary for the war effort, were not available anymore, as they either fled the country or were imprisoned. Well, they tried to reintegrate the former officers, but this only partially worked. A further problem was that Iran now was forced to either cannibalize other systems or turn to front companies and smugglers to bypass Western sanctions if when they wanted to repair Western systems and receive spare parts. This need to quickly indigenize military production thus would build the foundation of their future army and like in the case of Turkey, form the future of their UAV program. The Iran Iraq war would quickly evolve into a trench warfare with World War I style mass human wave attacks in the situation that American targeting drones flourished. Operated by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the drones flew 940 missions and took around 54,000 pictures. But Iran would innovate with the establishment of the Quds Aviation Industry Company by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as wing of its self-sufficiency organization launched its first indigenous drone in 1985, the Quds Moja 1 or immigrant. In an evolution of the US targeting drones already available to Iran, the Quds Moja would be a major step for Iran's UAV program. The Quds Moja could be transported by two men and scout out enemy positions and track troop movements. But the Quds Moja was still mild away from our modern sophisticated drones as it only had a oblique camera in its nose and photos had to be developed after it landed. For the first time, the Iranians also tried to arm their drones by mounting RPG launchers to the wings of the drones. I highly doubt that this ended up being the success it was promised it would be, as the target would have needed to be in the direct line of sight of the operator for it to be accurate. Another pattern that will repeat itself in the future is the immense competition between the institutions of Iran, as not just Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps would develop a drone, but also the Iranian manufacturing industry company would develop the Abdali. The Abdali was a suicide drone or loitering munition, which meant it was Iran's first true combat drone. The HESA Abadil would only play a limited role during the Iran-Iraq war as it was built in the tail end of it, the war and only enjoyed limited combat. These two lines of drones would become the base of the Iranian drone program. They became the base of 
Future Evolution is built under the same name, but ever evolving with the aim of becoming formidable drones able to compete and best even Western drones. Both series would head into the same tried and true direction, becoming traditional combat drones like the Reaper or her own. The Abadil 3, the latest evolution, is based on claims of the Iranian government able to fly 1,500 kilometers at speeds of 900 kilometers per hour and able to reach heights of up to 45,000 feet. Armed with a copy of the Israeli Spike missile, it is able to supposedly reliably deal with tanks and other armored vehicles, besides its basic guided bomb capabilities. The Moja 6 is the latest version of the Moja Ha series, demonstrating significant advancements made in recent years. It has a range of 200 kilometers and can operate for up to 12 hours. The Moja series has been used by Iran's regular army and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. And various capacities. The models were utilized for reconnaissance missions in Afghanistan, while later versions were employed for maritime surveillance in the Strait of Hormuz and to maintain internal and border security. The Moja 6 has reportedly been used against militant groups such as Kurdish dissidents in Iraq. By showcasing its drone capabilities in military operations, Iran aims to demonstrate their advancements to advertise and attract potential buyers by proving the system's combat effectiveness. The Iranian drone program would become an essential part of the Iranian army. As Michael Rubin puts it, there have been three main pillars to the Islamic Republic asymmetric military response. The first is naval, the second is the ballistic missile program, and the third is the unmanned aerial vehicle UAV fleet. This emphasis on the Iranian UAV program would be see Iran utilize its drones as a tool in its geopolitical toolbox. Iran would begin to fly patrols over nearby countries, at first only Iraq, and extended to Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Sudan, Gaza and Afghanistan. The Persian Gulf and the Strait of Hormuz would be also an important point of contention as it is vital for the global economy. The US aimed as part of the CAPS program to establish permanent combat air patrols all over the world by having drones in their air 24-7 in some 240 locations and as mentioned a focal point of this program was the Persian Gulf. But America only managed to establish around 60 of these bases. To break America, Iran established a network of drone bases along the south of the Strait of Hormuz. These would be located at a desert strip at Kishim Island near Bandar Abbas and the port of Bandar Yask as well as Minap and Konark. But Iran wouldn't just use its drones to secure its borders or close proximity but also use it as a tool in its political endeavors elsewhere as it would send UAVs and other support equipment to allies in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq and Yemen where they would be used to full extent. The Iranian drones and their operating factions would be able to shoot down and retrieve foreign drones which could be retrieved and sent back to Iran. Among those were the American Predator, Reaper and Scan Eagle drones and the Israeli Heron and Hermes 450 drones. This would be of major importance to the future of the Iranian UAV program, as it would be able to reverse engineer these drones and use certain aspects in their own drones. They basically copy them. The Predator and Hermes 450 became the Shahid 129, the workhorse of the modern Iranian army. The Scan Eagle became the Quds Yazir, but the biggest catch of the Iranian initiative would be a Sentinel UAV. In 2011, Iran claimed to have hacked and brought down a US Lockheed Martin RQ-160 70 Sentinel stealth UAV, which was conducting surveillance on Iran's nuclear program. Iran recovered the drone intact and extracted valuable technological secrets from it. They accused Russia and China of it requesting to inspect the drone. Iran then began to reverse engineer the drones to create its own version. In 2014, Iran showcased a crude replica of the RQ-170 called the Shahid-171 at an aerospace exhibition in Tehran. It falsely claimed that the replica had the same capabilities as the original drone. Iran later released a video in 2014 showcasing a smaller drone that they claimed to be the RQ-170 clone in flight. In October 2000. In 2016, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps officially unveiled the Sahif, later known as Sahif 1, which was a smaller version of the RQ 170. The Sahif contained the same wing shape of the original drone, but lacked its frontal air intake. Ran promoted the Sahif 1 as a long range unmanned combat aerial vehicle capable of carrying four precision guided anti tank missiles. 
Iran relies on the use of drones for two main purposes, surveillance and attack. Due to its vast size and challenging terrain, surveillance poses a significant and multifaceted threat to the country, spanning an area approximately six times larger than Great Britain or equivalent to the combined land mass of California, Idaho, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, and Washington. Iran's geography presents a diverse obstacle to effective surveillance efforts. The presence of natural barriers further complicates this task. With a formidable Zagros mountain range straddling the border with Iraq and the majestic Alboros chain culminating in the 19,000 feet Damavand stretching across northern Iran. Additionally, the southern frontier with Iraq is marked malaria swarms and oppressive heats, while the Sistan and Baluchistan region situated near the border of Pakistan along the Arabian Sea featured rugged hills and inhospitable badlands. In September 2013, General Amir Ali acknowledged the potential military application of the Shahid 129 drone but emphasized its primary use within Iran, particularly for the protection of international waters, borders, and the vast expanses of central desert. Echoing this sentiment, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Commander Muhammad Ali Jafir in September 2013 outlined the Shahid 129's role as protecting the Islamic homeland and its vast borders, whether confronting bandits or other insecurities. This statement underscores the paramount importance placed on the deployment of UAVs to ensure the robust defenses and security of Iran's expansive border. Building upon this notion, Defense Minister Hossein Degahan affirmed six weeks later Iran's intentions to utilize this newly acquired Fortos UAV to protect our border, maritime borders, and oil pipelines. The second use is that to attack, which is to support interests outside of the territory of Iran. This has most prominently been done in places like Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, but most notably in Russia, which was supplied with an unknown number of Iranian drones, most likely in the high hundreds. This saw Iran supply Russia with Shahid 131, 139, 129, and Mojah 6 UAVs. And in return, Iran would receive vital modern aircraft in the form of 24 Su-34 aircraft. Originally, Destined for Egypt, the drones would partially operate under cover. Names as Shahid 131 and Shahid 139 were renamed to Gehran 1 and Gehran 2. This transfer of equipment would be of great benefit for Russia, as especially the Gehran 1 and Gehran 2 would fulfill an area in which Russia was lacking. These drones would be used in similar roles as the Russian Landsat drone, but also be a replacement for Russian cruise missiles to directly bombard Ukrainian cities. The Iranian drone program is by far one of the most promising programs. It has shown that it as a third world or developing nation can still produce drones that could rival those of first world nations. And while a large part of their modern drone arsenal finds its roots in western tech, the Iranians have shown that they can adapt and overcome. It is still important to note that the western sanctions have an immense impact on their capabilities, which has been shown by the reliance on German Limprecht engines, which are used in multiple of their UAVs and had to be smuggled or transported through front companies into Iran. But apparently Currently, they now have switched to a Chinese knockoff motor, which is a, I think, a better solution. An idea which I find quite interesting is that Iran's quick openness to begin integrating drones into their military in comparison to their neighbors is a result of their religion. As Shia leaders have been rather open to adopt new technologies, while Sunni ones condemn them, exemplified by Iran's openness to begin using telegraphs, or Iran beginning its nuclear program relatively early in comparison to the rest of the world. This was the long promised Iran drone program video. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it really much because it's peak content and shit, you know, man. Um, Jinnar out. Have a nice evening. Mm -hmm.